Thank you, Lord, for yes. this day. Thank you for everything that you're, you're doing here and that's going to be accomplished in Jesus' name. Yeah. All right, you can be seated. Just keep you, keep you on your toes there for a little bit. I want to start out with a scripture um, because we prayed the blessing and we called the blessing on Wednesday night um, out on our property for this region and for this church. And uh, Proverbs 11.11 11 says, By the blessing of the influence of the upright and God's favor, meaning because of them, the Amplified says, the city is exalted. But it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. And so that's a principle we can look at when we call the blessing and we're looking at um, moving ahead in God and his empowerment of how the, the kingdom is moving through us. We can know that literally if we're in an upright position, which just means in the right spot with God, righteous, and we are his righteousness, right? So if we're in that spot and we're just hot after being um, you know, obedient to him, we can literally have so much influence on a city that the city itself gets exalted. It, and meaning in a way of like brought up out of darkness, Amen. brought up out of junk, right? So that's the power of the blessing and God's favor. Um, these two things tie together by the blessing of the influence of the upright, number one, and God's favor. Because of these two things, a city is exalted. But all it takes is it's overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. So that's a big responsibility for us that if we're in an upright spot, that we need to be calling things yeah. to the blessing, yeah. to his favor. Amen. Call the favor of the Lord. We want this to take place because we're, we're not losing our city. We are not losing our city. All these surrounding areas, that's our city. We live there. We don't have to speak wicked about it, speak wicked about the police department or whatever it is. We don't want to be part of bringing it down. There's got to be a way that our influence literally lifts it up, right? All right, let's go to Romans 8. Romans 8, we talked about, and I'm just going to do a little bit of a refresher there. Um, the reason that I'm dealing with this, I believe, is the Holy Spirit is saying, you know, we've... we've come so far in this series now of understanding how he works, how he operates. And, um, and then we're also very much opposed to the Antichrist anointing, right? Yes, yeah. So every time um, we keep going through the word, it's like, here's the Antichrist anointing. Here's what God looks like. God is really showing his body right now, that clear, definite line. That's a result of the hand of the Lord moving. When the hand of the Lord removes or moves, he divides things out. That's also uh, a result of the word going forth because the word itself has its own inherent power and it will divide things out, wrong from right, in the deepest part of our hearts. And so it's really important right now as to where um, this revival is going to be taking place, where those next moves that we're going to make, what pastor just got done talking about. It's really important for us to know that we're hearing the voice of the Spirit and can automatically say, nope, that's not of God, and divide something out. Yeah. And Romans 8 um, really personalizes it because what we tend to do um, as Christians many times and, and I teach all over the place, and when I do, I hear these things where, where people will say, well, I made that poor choice because the devil talked to me, or there was this influence that, that came on me. Can that have an effect? Yes. But James says we're enticed and dragged away by our own evil desires. So that means we're, we're walking around in a housing that actually is opposed to God. And like I said um, last time I spoke the first part of this, is isn't it like our God who sets a table before us in the presence of our enemies, according to Psalms 23, right? That's the kind of God he is, that he would move into a temple that is actually opposed to him. Yeah. Like, that's a good place to live. I'll just come on in there, <laughs> right? In fact, he's looking for the more opposed you are, the more he wants to move in. That's the kind of God he is. And when you, when you think about that, he, that means he's not intimidated by our junk. He's not intimidated at all. And he's an example to us of the blessing. Yeah? The blessing is not a religion that says, all right, we're all doing pretty good. Let's huddle together. Let's stay together. We don't want to go out there where darkness is or, or the appearance of evil is. Stay together. That's opposite of how God works. God's like, look at that evil over there. Let's go bring the blessing. Yeah. 
Let's go move right in. Let's set a table before them, right in the presence of enemies. That's the kind of God he is. That's evangelism. And this is where you'll know, because once again, Antichrist anointing is selfish, and it'll say there is a God and deny the power thereof. So if you're denying the power thereof, you're going to look at people who you consider evil, and you're going to say, I want to be a part of that. I want to keep what I have to me. That's Antichrist anointing. The Spirit of God will automatically lead you to that place to talk to that person no one else wants to talk to. And when God moves, everything moves. And this is where sometimes we'll get involved in a situation and we'll be like, man, everything's moving. Demons are raising up their head. There's this over here. This is good. You still bring in the, breath, the blessing. Because literally when you walk into a place that, that is just harnessed around with evil and the blessing is there, all of that's going to react to what you're carrying. Yep. Yeah. That's right. yep. yeah. So naturally you should see something demonic. There should be somebody saying something sassy. Yeah? It should be, you know, contrary to the word kind of stuff, evil looks, that kind of stuff. And then you go, ah, I'm in the right place. Yeah. yeah. yeah Led by the Spirit, you do that. Yeah. You only set up a table in the presence of the enemies when you're, the Spirit of the living God has said that. So here we are, Romans 8, verse 5, laid it out for us how we can tell since... He's, he's in this housing that's opposed to God. He lays it out how it's not really all the demons out there that we need to be concerned about. If we want to stay away from Antichrist anointing, we want to be in the spirit. It's this that we're living in, that we're concerned about first. Because once this is taken care of, and this is put under, and we're able to die to this flesh and be alive in the spirit, what, why are we concerned about the demonic realm? But if we're carrying around this opposed thing that, that doesn't want anything to do with God and we're letting it do whatever it wants and then we're like, yeah, we're going to go street witnessing. Not going to work well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You'll be your biggest enemy. Right. So this is what it says. Verse 5, Romans 8. For those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by its unholy desires set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. So we broke that down. So in case you don't know how your flesh works... This is how it works. It says, if we're come over and we're according to the flesh, which means it's like an accordion, we just move on over real tight to that thing that your flesh wants. Then we become controlled by it, number two, and, and by its unholy desires, that's when we set our mind. Once your mind is set, you will pursue something that's fleshly. You set it already. So the key is that we be so submitted to the spirit that our mind is not allowed to set itself on anything but the Spirit. Yes. Yeah? So it means we have to catch it up front. Because once you're already in pursuit, you're like, what are we doing? And you just go. And you're just like, what happened? I don't know how I got involved in that. Well, there was a whole process that took place that got you into that spot. But those who are according to the Spirit, same kind of program of steps, and are controlled by the desires of the Spirit. It doesn't say that you are controlled by how you would like to see Christianity be so God can be pleased when he watches you. See, because that's how religion does too. It's like, well, I'm going to set up like a whole program. We're going to really go after this thing. God's really going to, oh, he is going to be shocked at how well I'm doing in this Christian life and how much I love. And, I, and it's like, we've taken control. You're in your flesh. It just sounds pretty, but you're fleshly. And so it, it goes back to those who are according to the Spirit. So to be according to it, you have to come over to it. That will give over control to the Spirit. Oh, that's where the line between religion and true Christianity is. Yeah. Because it's like, well, I don't have any control in this. I gave that to God. <laughs> he can ask me whatever he wants, and I'm, I told him I'd do it. See, that's that choice that if I could pick out anything out of this verse and say, deal with that, it would take care of a whole lot of stuff. Because once we've given over the control, he'll help us with every other thing. But if I have control and I'm asking him to bless something, how's that going to work? It's my control, my thing, and I want you to approve of it and bless me. Now, this is backwards. That's not how it's laid out. You are according to the Spirit and are controlled by the desires of the Spirit set their minds on. So this is God's desire, and I am to set my mind on that. I am set 
And I will seek the things which gratify the Holy Spirit. So we know in the end, it really isn't about me and my agenda and where I think this thing should go or what could make me look the best in the end. I mean, because I just want to be gratified. And I just know God will be so happy that I'm happy and everything's going well for me. No, I find the joy of the Lord because I've gratified him. That makes me happy. Just to know... He asked me to do it. I don't even know how we pulled this off, but I set myself into obedience and he empowered it and I'm just blown away by his glory. That that even happened. I just showed up. See, it goes back to that. Where it's such a fine line of what's happening in the churches all across America in that it's antichrist anointing, but it looks like a God thing. It looks very much Christian-y. It sounds Christian-y, you know? It, so- it sounds pretty. It sounds nice. It sounds, you know, um, like, like we've actually got different levels we can get to of how good we look in this whole thing. When it comes down to it, to be dead to ourselves means we gave over the control to the Spirit yeah. Yeah. on everything, Amen. in all things. Yeah. See, if we want to be blessed in all things, in all ways, at all times, you don't have the blessing. Right. So in all things... Oh, this is my thing. That's separate from God. Well, is it your blessing on it or his? In all ways, at all times. See, there's a clarification that has to take place. We don't separate ourselves away. God is literally the one who is blessing us in all things, in all ways, at all times that we might give. That we might give in all things, in all ways, at all times. It's his power that's doing that. It's not like all of a sudden he just... Drop some finances on us. And we got, we got it from here, God. We're just going to go. No, there, there is an empowerment on that finances. There's an empowerment on the knowledge you get in church. We're going to be held accountable. America has so much knowledge out there. Sermon after sermon and good stuff and everything's accessible to you or whatever. We'll be held accountable for the fact that this was the table that was set before us. And a lot of people don't even want to eat it. Or they eat it and change it to fit how they would like to see it go. So the flesh is something that we need to know. We're walking around in it. It's not this outside thing that's going to... No, we're enticed and dragged away by our own evil desires. Where are those evil desires? In our flesh. So our biggest enemy is us. And when that's rained back, you'll see people who are in a situation like, you know, if fear is under control in me or just cut out of me by the Spirit then walking into a situation, I'm not even thinking down that line. I'm not thinking like, oh my goodness, what if this guy who just came off the streets would kill me right now or whatever. I'm not thinking down that because there's a certain part of my flesh I've died to. Well, then I'd be dead. Anyways, I'm trying to follow the spirit here. If he tells me to go, I'm not going to go, what if and how come? And You go, right? Because the spirit said so. That's why we have to know how to hear his voice. Now, the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason, verse 6, without the Holy Spirit is death. Death that comprises all the miseries arising from sin. That's that thing that we're dealing with. All the miseries arising from sin (laughs) dwell in that, both here and hereafter. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul peace both now and forever. So we can have soul peace. Mind, will, and emotions can be at peace now, today. This isn't a religion where it's like down the line, I was a sinner, and now I just got to hold on till he comes. Your peace is now, at this moment. If you came in here and you were upset about anything, you can be at peace before you leave. Yeah, Yeah, it's how you posture yourself. It's where you put yourself, and it's what you say to your flesh. See, sometimes we waste time going, I bind that demon, I bind that demon, I bind that demon. Why don't you just say, flesh, shut up. I came here to worship the Lord, and you're going to do what I tell you to do. You're not in control of this. The spirit in me is control of this, and everything else has got to follow. How I think has got to follow. How I walk has got to follow. What you feel right now has got to follow. You're coming with me. I'm not coming with you. Yeah. So we need to know that there's a separation in that. That is because the mind of the flesh, verse 7, with its carnal thoughts and purposes, is hostile toward God. So our flesh did not play around. 
It's not just a little uncomfortable with God living in us. It's hostile about it. Like, this is dumb. I don't see where we should have to do this. This is, you know, it's like an enemy that will just rise up. And, and the more God moves in us, sometimes you'll see sickness happen in a person who maybe was fine before, looked like they were fine before um, they gave their life to God. And he sets up inside of them and things start moving around. Yeah. Things start getting exposed that were there waiting as an enemy. And you think, why did this happen to me? I just gave my life to God. Things are being exposed. The blessing wants to overtake that. Yeah. Drive that literally out of your flesh. Yeah, yeah? yeah? So we can see that. And if we're at any time hostile because God has asked us to do something, I, I will tell you from teaching anger resolution for years, one of the things I know is no one has a good measurement of themselves. You can see that other person in their anger, but you can't see yourself. And so you think, well, no, I wasn't hostile to our God. I just said I I didn't like it. I mean, that's all I was saying is I didn't like it. But somebody looking from the outside would be like, man, you were freaking out. You just flipped out when he asked you to do that. What is your problem? I did not. I I was not hostile to her. But we have to know that our flesh, we're used to living in it. And so we many times don't see our strong reaction and how strong it really is. To mature means we'll be willing now. Remember we said when I preached a sermon on being ready, it means you're on standby, you're already standing there. I'm ready now. What are you going to ask me to do today, Lord? I'm ready now. I'm not getting ready. I'm not working on being ready and maybe I'll get to a certain point. I'm ready now. I'll be obedient now. But I don't have my act together. I don't care. He's asked me to do this now. So I'm going to go do it now, and he's going to empower me. All right, let's turn our, uh, our word to James chapter 2. Which, by the way, congratulations. I keep looking at you. I'm like, oh, it's exciting. Anyway, um, James chapter 2 starts out, and, you know, I like to take the whole book and say, what were they talking about all the way through? And you should, t- you should do that with the word. So we're not just pulling out a random scripture. What was that really talking about before? three, four chapters even before that. And he's telling us, James chapter one, you know, how, once again, talking about the flesh and, and what's the way that, that we should have a right attitude. And even in verse 14 of chapter one says, but every person's tempted when he's drawn away, enticed, and baited, as how the Amplified says, by his own evil desire. There's a little bait there that will, will and, and you bite for that. It's a lust and a, and a a passion that ends up happening. Talks about how that will give birth to sin, goes down the line on that. And then it starts out in chapter two, talking about our attitudes. Well, that's still tied to James chapter one. Our attitudes of how we treat people, even. You know, it, it shouldn't be that, you know, I give special play. Oh, that guy's got a business in town. He's a millionaire. Let's make sure he ends up in the, in the front row. That's what it's talking about in the first part here. And, oh, well, that person just works over there. You know, I guess we're out of chairs. Maybe they could sit on the floor here. Being that judge. I actually just dealt with somebody who um, it, it was a horrible situation that they were in. Literally, a, a leader of theirs, a pastor of sorts, <laughs> um, sorted out the people as to who was a hypocrite and who wasn't. You guys may go downstairs, and you have to stay up here because you're the hypocrites. We're going to deal with you. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) What gave this person the right? And people followed because of the condemnation that was already there and how they could not see themselves. And it's like, yeah, I'm just a loser. I guess I'm a hypocrite. A lot of people followed that. And it it was horrible. But anyways, nobody gives us that right to, everybody's treated equal. I don't care how much you make or whatever. And it talks about that in this first part of the chapter chapter and talks about attitude. And then it comes up here and uh, verse 11 talks about don't commit adultery. And we're supposed to speak in verse 12 and act as people of God. It goes down and then it says, so it's dealing with all different areas. I mean, if you want to know if you've got right attitudes or if you're walking with the spirit, it's like, well, I got to make sure I have this in my life. Got to make sure I got that. This is a good measurement. You can kind of go down this. And it says, if a brother or sister is poorly clad, verse 15, and lacks food for each day, And one of you says to him, goodbye, keep yourself warm and well-fed without giving him the necessities for his body. What good does that do? So also faith, if it does not have works, deeds, and actions of obedience to back it up, by itself is destitute 
of power inoperative and dead. I'm going to read that one again. So also faith, if it does not have works, deeds and actions of obedience to back it up, by itself is destitute of power, inoperate and dead. So we're asking the Spirit of God to move. I've been in many prayer meetings. I've led a lot of prayer meetings over the years. I have seen where people will come in and literally just beg the Holy Spirit to move. And I've been in that spot. And there's a time and a place for that. But... That just move, Lord, move, Lord, bless me, Lord, Lord, change the situation, Lord, uh, you know, do this, do that, or whatever, and then they leave, and their acts of obedience are nada, zilcho, not moving ahead, not even concerned about that part, nothing, not concerned. Their main concern is I just need him to hear me and then I want him to do this thing for me. I'm not really concerned about what he's asking of me, though. That's not my concern. I just, I mean, come on. It's his word says this, so he should do this. And that is so flesh. That is so anti-Christ anointing. And so we're afraid sometimes that we'll get caught up. I'll have people, well, we don't want to get caught up in the doctrine that everything's works. Well, as far as we're trying to get away from that, you know, it's like, then we have no works, right? That's what's happening. We're pendling, swinging all, all the way over that. And that's not God either. We don't go out and do things for a work. If it's a work in us, it's a work of flesh. I can go out down to Minneapolis and make all kinds of sandwiches and go out to the street people and feed them and be in my flesh. God never told me to do it. It was a nice thing to do. I mean, I could go down there and do that nice thing because it was nice. But if I do that as like, uh, this this is my works, I got to do this, and then he owes me this. That's usually what we have tied to. That's how come when I'm witnessing to people, they'll say, well, you know, did you think so-and-so died? Do you think they knew Christ? Oh, they were such a nice person. They would give you the shirt off their back. I'm telling you, if you needed gas money, they, they were right there. That didn't answer my question. Did they know Christ? People can do nice things. There's a difference of doing those things in the Spirit. And being obedient. The the kingdom moves ahead when we're in line with where he's at. It doesn't, you know, it's kind of like, well, it's moving ahead. We get in line with it, I should say. And we move with it. But that means it's by the spirit, in the spirit, and what he's asking us to do. That's where the most production is. Is it nice and did it help people that have fed them sandwiches? Yes. Did it produce a whole big thing in the kingdom? Probably not. When he tells you to go do something by the Spirit, you will find that person that has been waiting for Christ. You will find that person that needs healing. You will find those people that it's like, thank God you showed up today. And there'll be a God moment in it because it was by the Spirit. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. in in our America, we look, and I had somebody tell me, and they said, well, you know, we just, if there's a bomb that goes off or a hurricane or something, our country is right there just giving. So that should count for something. It can, but how many people's attitudes are, well, you know, it's the the thing to do. I mean, or I want to do that because that'll make us look good. There are those few that are doing this by the Spirit. That's when it really counts. That's when God will say, I'm pleased with that. He's not pleased just because we do a thing. And so it's really important that if we're following the Spirit, once again, this is a way of dividing things out and saying what is of the flesh and what what is of the Spirit. Here he says, so you have somebody right in front of you. Do you have an act of obedience? Did you go to God and say, God, you know, this person has needs. What are you asking me to do? Some of us will just go to our garage and empty it out and give it to them. God never asked you to do that. I have been standing in front of, I stood in front of a, a lady that needed so much stuff. It was killing me that I wasn't getting a release to give her anything. God told me to ask her, why have you walked away from me? And I'm like, yeah, but God, look at her. I mean, she needs this. And then I should, you know, because I have this at home. I could just, no. When you're following the spirit, it's, it's sometimes it's a yes and sometimes it's no. It's not every time. So we have to know that because some of us will give all of our stuff away. On the other hand, God will ask us sometimes to give that one thing. They're like, what? I just got that. We just, you know how much that cost me? Oh, this can't, I take authority over you in the name of Jesus. You are, 
That's what we do. But to be in the spirit means willingness is happening at all times. I'm willing, I'm willing, but there is order to it. You don't just go off in your own emotional, your own emotional thing. So, and one of you, okay, so here we go. So also faith, verse 17, if it does not have works, deeds and actions of obedience to back it up by itself is destitute of the power inoperative and dead. But someone will say to you and to you then, you say you have faith and I have good works. Now you show me your alleged faith apart from any good works. If you can, and I, by good works of obedience, will show you my faith. Because really what he's saying is a lot, there's a lot of people going, oh, I have faith. I believe, I believe in God. I believe, well, where's your acts of obedience that follow that? This is kind of blunt, but that's the way the Holy Spirit talks to me in the sense, that's the only way he can get my flesh to shut up and go divide this out. Otherwise, it's too pretty and it's too nice and I can't. I'm like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> He's just up front and, and he'll just through his words say, you don't say you have faith on something unless you've already asked God. And he said, and this is how you're going to walk this out. And you're willing and obedient to do that. Think about it. Churches are full of people who come in for worship, come in and they have their coffee, they listen to the sermon, and they're out of faith. They're out of faith. That's all they do. That's their thing right there. And then it's over and they go home and there's nothing more. That's Antichrist. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And the body of believers is being fed that even from the leadership. I mean, the leadership, a lot of times in these churches will, will be like, well, I wish that would change. It'd be nice. It'd be so cool if it would change. But nobody's saying anything, right? Now, that doesn't mean I want you all to go out and just start doing works. What is the spirit of God telling you? Amen. What is he required of you? Because your flesh will be opposed to it. Your flesh will try to keep you going, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear it. It doesn't want to hear it. Your flesh will be that thing that will be the first thing to oppose it. Then maybe your neighbor or your grandma or somebody else will help to add to that. But usually when they do, they're poking at something that's already in your flesh. And it makes sense to you. So it's like, well, grandma said. Yeah? Yeah. All right, let's continue to read. You believe that God is one. You do well. So in, in this part, people have taken this scripture out. He just got done talking about if you have faith and you have obedience and you're doing something, right? And then he says, you believe, adding right to that, that God is one. You do well. So do the demons believe in shudder and terror and horror, such as it makes a man's hair stand on end and, and contract the surface of his skin. So that's how, my, how thrilled he was about like, well, you say you have faith, but you're not doing anything. What is the thing when God tells you, when God gives you a picture of something, this is where you're going to go. What is the first act of obedience he's asked you to do to get there? A lot of times we'll say, I'm in faith. It's out there. Man, it's out there. One time he gave me a dream of. Yep. Yeah. Did you write it down? Well, no, I can remember it. And there was a dream, uh, something I, I feel one day he's going to have me do. And you're doing what about that dream? How have you positioned yourself? What's the next thing you're going to do in that dream? Did you call the county and ask if there's rules about that thing? Hey, can you set this such and such up there? What are the rule, What are the laws? Do you need more education on that dream? No, I'm just waiting for God because I'm in faith. I'm waiting for God. Faith without works is dead. Here's the dream. What are the works? What are the works? Because you can't even do the works without the blessing and him empowering you. So don't separate it out in your mind that here's the dreams and now he wants me to do all this stuff and then he'll first do some. No, you can't even pull the works part off without his power. Can you? You can do some things with, uh, you know, in your flesh. But to go to school, to get more education on something, to reposture yourself or whatever, it's going to take strength to get out of bed in the morning and even have the want to. And that comes through the blessing. So we don't want to separate that away in that. Are you willing to be shown proof, you foolish, unproductive? Oh, now he is talking. 
Straight up. All right. Are you willing to be shown proof, you foolish, unproductive, spiritually deficient fellow, that faith apart from good works is inactive and ineffective and worthless? So you can drive through a city, and there can be 10 churches, and, you know, maybe 50,000 people, or I don't know how, how that ratio goes out in a city, and you think, oh, they got a lot of churches here. This is good. None of them may be in faith. One of them may be in faith. Yeah? You might have a pastor who's trying to have faith. And people show up in their religiosity and that's all the farther it goes. We are opposed to that because that is opposing to the spirit. So then we posture ourselves with that. Yeah, we don't want none of that here. And then he just goes, you foolish, unproductive, spiritually spiritually deficient. Yet we said we had faith. No, you're spiritually deficient if we're not stepping some of these things out. That uh, faith apart from good works is inactive and ineffective and worthless. Then he goes on and talks about Abraham and lays that out um, and how that he was going to offer Isaac. And then verse 22 says, you see that his faith was cooperating with his good works and his faith was completed and reached its supreme expression when it, he implemented it by good works. So he was asked to offer Isaac, which, by the way, Isaac was not a little boy. All studies show that this was a man. Yeah. So, you know, it's one thing, you get this horrific feeling just thinking about, I'm going to go sacrifice your little boy, right? And there's another thing, it's like, um, hey, Eric, we're going up the mountain, you know, it's like, Jess, I mean, there's a different, there's a different feeling that goes with that too. So that's a person who can reason out and he's just willfully following. But remember, Abraham commanded his children, which didn't mean he bossed them around. He caused them to want to serve, yeah. Yeah. right? So Isaac went willingly. I don't know what's happening with dad. He's got this whole plan, the deal. I'm just going to go. So in that process, you see that his faith was cooperating with his works and his faith was completed and reached its supreme expression when he implemented it by good works. So I brought an example of something um, today. I just was years ago. I was probably 17 years old. My father signed me up for an art class. And I, I was that person that they came up to my room one day and and there were all these cartoon characters drawn on the walls. <laughs> I thought if I do a good job, you know, they're not going to care, right? And uh, so I had cartoon characters on my door and different things like that. And they didn't, they didn't always come in my room, so it took a little bit for them to notice, like, what are you doing? You just drew all over the wall. And then that didn't thrill them, so I started drawing on paper and hanging that on the wall and, and being able to do that. And he said, well, I, I want you to be able to, to take this course. Well, long story short, things in our life really stunk and were very dysfunctional. We were without Christ. And I was fed up with that whole thing. And I moved out at 17 and moved out on my own. And I would have just turned um, or was going to turn 17, moved out on my own, end up milking cows um, before I'd go to school. And when I get home at night, because there was a farmer that had about 200 cows, lived right across the street from the little trailer that I was living in. And my thing was, when I was, was there, was I was so mad. I, I was mad at my parents. I was mad at everything. And I was, to defy, I said, yeah, I can hand my stuff in. I'm not doing this art thing. This, you know, who does he think he is? I was totally in my flesh. And so I quit handing stuff in. Well, the art school contacted him. And his art school here in Minnesota, it's the same uh, art school that, they, that the guy who created Snoopy, um, you know, that whole series or whatever, Charlie Brown, um, graduated from. And so you'd have to send your stuff in the mail. All of a sudden, Dad shows up at the trailer and says, what are you doing? You're going to flunk out of this. I mean, I, I, in good faith, I did this for you. You're going to flunk out. And I, I'm like, you know, I don't even care. You guys, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> and And because I was mad at all the dysfunction and everything that happened in the home. Well, so I let that go. But I always saved my first couple assignments. I mean, we'd, we'd move from one house to the next in Colorado, and I always had that in the box. It was my, my assignment from when I did that. So it did mean something to me. 
because otherwise I'd have thrown it out. But I just wanted that first assignment and, and to be able to do it. Well, that had the, the phone number of everything on there. And then going through, you know, speeding up into our nowadays, it was uh, probably eight years ago now, the Lord told me, um, you need to go back and do that. Don't you want to do that? I go, I'm in the ministry. I'm a counselor. I'm this. I, you know, how is that going to play in my life? And then he said, you need to do that for you. You need to do that for you to develop you. And it's going to develop something in you to see that you can. And if that's all you get out of it, then that's what you get. So I dug out that little first assignment that had the grade on it and it had the phone number. And I'm like, we don't even know these people exist. And I call, they show up at the house, I end up in the school, and totally like, what am I doing? Like I need another thing to do, right? <laughs> so in between, I'm, I'm learning to draw and sending the stuff in, and I'm like, ah, you know, sometimes I'd get a C. Oh, you know, sometimes I'd be like, I think something's really good, and this is going to be a good one, and not lower grade. Then I'd be like, this is junk. I send it in, and I get an A. So it was kind of like, ah. Oh. So I went through a lot of emotions um, just doing that. Well, then I met a dear friend through uh, Vicki, and um, doing that, she's an awesome artist. She's a painter, and just out of the blue, she said, why don't you come over, and I'll teach you how to paint. Well, this thing came up inside of me, like, <laughs> and then I was like, no, that'd be so weird. I don't know. I, don't know. And I just had all kinds of emotions, and I think it went back to what happened once again at that 17-year-old spot where I was trying to figure out who am I, what's going on. So I had all that come up inside of me. And then on top of it, I knew the kind, I saw some of her pictures. We're talking epic. We're talking, they should be lit up in some museum or something, you know what I mean? And, and so, and then I'm going to her house. So a few weeks back, I went to her house and I, and I had my, my first lesson. And, um, I could, I freaked out inside. I mean, there was all kinds of emotions going through me. And I'm the person who can go into a jail and I'm just, I just go in there. I can go in maximum security, whatever. I don't have that like, you know, I just go. Meet somebody on the street who's high, whatever. You know, I don't have that. But here now I'm going to paint a picture and I'm freaking out. Okay, so that shows us we all have different areas we need to grow. And I'm thinking, God, what are you trying to show me? So I get into her house, beautiful house, and I'm sitting there. And she starts setting everything up. And when she does, how she sets it up, she's setting it up in this little studio part that she has. And so I'm about to paint while I'm looking around at all of her pictures <laughs> in front of her. And all of a sudden, I felt really small. And I'm like, well, you know, you know. And this is when usually what we do. This is a dream that actually I told my husband, I'd love to be able to paint. We go museums, different things. Oh, I wish I could paint that. Wouldn't that be great? Well, here now God's trying to make it happen. And I'm like, whoa, no, wait, 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 wait. And so I'm feeling all intimidated, and I'm, and I'm there. And she says, she goes, don't, don't worry about anything. You mess up, you mess up. It's your first time doing this. All right, all right. But I'm looking around, getting kind of intimidated where I'm sitting. And the first thing that she does and this is not uh, what you paint on, but it's white, so I'll, I'll just go with that. The first thing she does is she says, here's your canvas, right? And she, she puts it down. Now, one thing is when you're looking at somebody who's, who knows how to paint, you're excited to see what they're going to put on the canvas. But if I pulled some, somebody out, I said, Eric, come on up here. I want you to paint something in front of everybody right now on this white canvas. There's a very intimidating feeling. You're just like, because the first mark really leaves a mark. And so I sat in front of it, and I was like, I, I, I don't even know where to, huh. all right. So she said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to map out the picture. I'm all freestyle, and she's all about mapping it out. And so she axes this and keeps doing this. So it causes it to be like if you look at the picture of what you've chosen to paint, and you look at this, you should know where the nose is and all of that type of stuff. Well, I've never done that before either because I'm just, like I said, freelance. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and she goes, don't be afraid. Well, I didn't say I was afraid. Just a little intimidated, but you know. But I was. I was because I'm. And she hands me this brush, and I'm like, I'm froze to make that first mark. And she starts telling me about all the things that I've showed her that I've drawn. And she's like, you know, you did that, so you should be able to do this. Yeah, but this is going to leave the mark, and then you're going to see how dumb it looks on top of it. So there was some pride and stuff in there. And she said, that's what I want you to do. I want you to take this canvas and pick any color at all. I don't care what color it is, and just paint it. It's like anything. 
All right? So you can mix them if you want to. It's not going to screw up your picture. It's not going to screw up my picture? So I do. I get that whole thing, and all of a sudden it's kind of a yellowish, greenish, and hey, I'm starting to have fun. It's kind of like, ooh, you know? Like, uh, it's, it's felt free to do that. The intimidation left because I finally put something on that white. The last time we talked, we talked about how do you eat an elephant but one bite at a time. You have to make a move towards something before you're going to get that picture to take place. Now, I prayed about what that first picture would be, and it was a lion's head. All right, so that's, that's what I wanted. I, wa- I wanted this lion's head, and I thought, well, that'll be simple. We'll, we'll do this thing. And, and to get that onto here was so intimidating. I look at the lion's head, I look at this white nothingness. Well, now I've got this on, and we're going ahead with that. And it felt like now I'm actually getting somewhere. I just took a step. We just made a move. Where's the lion's face? Nowhere. Why aren't you going to be doing? Well, it's not time yet. I'm still doing this. So I let it dry a little bit. And the one thing she explained to me, any of you who are artists, is that um, watercolors are non-forgiving and oils are very forgiving, which means you can screw them up and you can fix it. You could take a picture, mess it all up, and you could paint that whole thing over on the same canvas and do it again. It forgives you. It forgives you. So there was a lot of pictures coming to me as I was doing this. The intimidation of actually the starting of something and how white that looked. And it was like, whatever I do, everyone's going to notice that dot, that mark. So I'm, I'm taking this as a type to when you're looking at what God has asked you to do. When he asks you to do something that's outside of everything that you can do, it looks like this. And like, yeah, but you have your picture of what you're trying to get over onto this. And yeah, here's the cool picture. See the cool picture? Everyone look at the picture. Isn't that cool? Oh, you're going to do that? Yeah, this is what I'm going to do. Now put it on here. Well, <laughs> you know, I, next week, we could probably get started on that. But, you know, because I got a lot of stuff going on in the office. You know, you got the, you can't expect me to be doing blah, 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 blah. That's what we do because we're intimidated to finally put something there. So I ended up sketching the, what sort of looked like the, the lion. What she said to do was shade everything first. Well, there's no picture there. Yeah, but put everywhere that you think it's going to be dark in the picture as a shadow. So I did. And I was like, that's kind of a blob of something. No, she said, that's your lion. And once again, the Lord spoke to me and said, that's what it's like to move into that next step. After you finally stepped out and you're doing something, you're putting it there and it's like, I ain't seen it. It's a blob. You got to know where the dark parts are and you got to know where the light parts are. You got to be able to see, okay, this is God and this is that part that's dark. And it's like, I finally got that. And I was starting to get excited because the Holy Spirit's talking to me the whole time. Then we took a break and we had a prayer meeting and then I came back and uh, went to, to, to paint again. This is the first time I've painted. And all of a sudden there was a freedom that started happening. That one phrase that she told me, oils are forgiven. The Holy Spirit is forgiving. He will move on you and he will cause you to be able, if you go, oh man, I ruined the eye on this picture. That's all right. Just start over. On the same canvas? Yeah. Do it. So this is not done by any means. This was just my first day, all right? This is not detailed. This was what I filled in, the dark. See? And then the eye just suddenly appeared when I did that. And different things started taking place. And it was, there was an excitement that happened to me. I started texting my kids. I'm like, oh, I'm painting. You know? They're like, why is she freaking out? I don't know. But, I, you know, it was like that type of thing. And it doesn't have to be like the best picture. It was just to know I could. There are many of you sitting here today that you haven't touched the canvas, but you have the picture. But you're afraid to leave that first mark, which is interesting because Felicia would not have known that I was going to speak this part of the sermon and what were the words that the Lord gave her the picture, new things. He's going to do that. But we have to be in that spot. It's like, go ahead. This is brand new, nothing on the canvas. You're going to leave your mark. You're going to leave your mark to be able to do that. Now, I have to go back and I have to learn how to make whiskers and there's so many details. This is more like a foggy picture of something 
and to get that to, to happen. But the Lord showed me through that whole thing, faith without works is dead. So every time I was in a museum, and I mean, I like Western art and all kinds of different things like that, um, and we'd be on our vacation, like, oh, I'd love to paint that picture. Look at how they did that. So, oh, I would love that. And it just comes up inside of me, and then you shut it back down because it's like, well, I'm in the ministry. We're doing this. That's not possible. We've got to move on. You know, you got to give up some things. Just lay them to the side, right? There's a place in that where I need to know that I can. I can be obedient to that next thing in God. And even if I put something on that canvas and it messes it up, it's forgiving. It's forgiving. It's not permanent. You don't take the whole dream. And some of you have done this and said, here's the picture. Oh, here's the canvas. I already messed it up. Throw it out. You know, if you pick something to draw or whatever and you're so excited about it, it meant something to you, it brought something alive in you, and you wanted to express that on this, and you hit that first thing, and you just didn't like it, and you just throw it out. Well, you're only going to throw it out so many times, and you're not going to keep going back to the store and buying a new canvas. It costs too much money, right? You feel too dumb about it. It will condemn you. By the second picture you throw out, you'll be like, I can't do this. I can't. I can't be that thing God's asking me to do. So once again, see, this is a different way of coming in and seeing where is the spirit versus the flesh? Because the flesh would have talked me out of even trying this. Then I look around at what's surrounded me in the studio and I'm like, no way, no way am I going to, ha. So I already belittled the whole situation. Well, you know, she's kind of a professional. And you do this kind of thing. So, you know, to comfort myself, I said, whatever happens on the canvas, you know, she already knows I don't don't paint and I've never painted. And all this is running through my head. And some of it's out of pride and some of it's out of shame. But it's what our flesh does to keep us from being obedient. Because God gives us a picture. When we were in the modular building, we had a service where people stood up, and I thought, oh, because I'm all about the fear of the Lord. I could feel the fear of the Lord in that place. They stood up and said, this is what I believe God's asking me to do. And the next person, this is what, he told me to write a book. And this one stood up. He told me whatever. Okay, let's pray and agree on that right now. I can only think of two people who have actually pursued Because, see, to be in the spirit about it, you see it, then I need to give over control regarding it, right? And when I do that, I'm going to set my mind. Next thing you know, I'm pursuing it. And I don't want to paint a picture that's good for me. I want to paint a picture that glorifies God. There's a big difference. Here this woman is just a woman of God, and she, she paints... But she'll throw a picture out if, after she painted it, she knows she did it in her flesh. She's like, that's a dumb picture. You look at it, you're like, it's awesome. But she'll throw it out because there's something. She said, I want it to glorify God. I want to feel that the anointing is going on that canvas. So I learned an extreme amount that day when it comes to the things of the flesh and of the spirit. And what he's wanting me to ask today is what picture did he give you that you've either not even touched the canvas yet or you did and you threw it out? You threw it out. Think about it. Pastor's been preaching on the Holy Spirit this whole time. So we're always looking at, um, you know, I wonder what we're going to learn about the Holy Spirit next. You can't be near the Spirit without him clarifying your destiny. Am I going to go out and be selling pictures and that's what I'm going to do now, quit the church or whatever? Probably not. I already know that part of my destiny, but I could have an influence if I learned it to paint. Learned it. And I need to go to a class on speech, apparently. Uh, if I learned it to paint. Um, but you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like it, there's, I could be an influence and everything you do could be an influence. God, how can you use this? I'm learning how to play guitar. How can you use this? I, I, you know, how can you use it? But we don't. We limit it. We're like, oh, that's for the people who know how to do that. Yeah. Somehow they just know. No, somehow they work their tail off, put the time in, 
got the education, did whatever it was they had to do. You know, in the future here, we'll be sharing some of our story. And when we share it, I don't want to share it in a way of like, oh, feel sorry for us as we were in the ministry. I mean, there are so many things. I know, I know Jimmy Swaggart, when they first started the ministry, him and his wife and his son slept in the back of their car for a long time because of obedience, right? I can just name different ones. And Kenneth Copeland started out in a, a little room. And he would get up, and he had one suit, and he would put that suit on, and that was his office. It was also his living room, and had one chair, and he would sit there. He's in the office. I'm in the ministry. And he kept saying to himself, I'm in the ministry. I'm getting sermons ready. That's what I'm doing. He put something on the canvas. And it didn't look pretty. It's like, this is it? <laughs> this is going to be one lame picture of this is where we're going. But until you put something down, you have nothing to work with. So that's what we need to do. What is it that's in your heart that by all this time speaking on the Holy Spirit, that he's moving? Because, you know, God moves, like I've said before, the sphere of his rule is the kingdom. And it moves, and it, it's cyclical. It's, it's his power going inside you. It wants to light up the gifts that are in there. Gifts you don't even know you have. Huh? What gifts do you have? that are hidden yet. Think about it. 1981, I told my parents that I'm going to be a rock star. I was committed to, man. I would starve myself, do whatever. This was, I don't care if I have food. I'm going, well, how are you going to feed? You know, because parents give you those speeches. Well, how are you going to pay for this? And how are you going to, I don't care. I'm writing songs and this is going to happen to me, you know. And so I get out. And I'm moving in this, and I'm, I'm convinced in my own flesh and everything. But yet I was imitating everybody around me rather than being myself because I didn't know how to be a rock star. Yeah. So I had to follow Aerosmith or whoever. Yeah, I wasn't unique to myself. Now if God asked me to do that, I would be unique to me. They would say, oh, that's, that, that's Mary. She sings like that. I wouldn't be trying to sound like everybody else. Yeah. Same thing, if I show you my picture... You're not trying to paint my picture. You paint yours. You paint yours. It'll be unique to you. Yeah. That's why, you know, and, and don't be offended if you've done this, but I don't like when, when parents are harping on their kids to stay in the lines all the time. Your three-year-old, stay in the line. You've got to stay in the line. It's their picture. They want to color Jesus' hair purple? Have at it. Maybe they like that color. That's their creativity. That's their... They should take ownership of, look what I did. Not, look how mom told me I had to use this color and do all this, and now I'm done, and here's my picture. They'll figure out his hair is in purple after a while. Yeah? That's okay. But we do that. We do that here in the church. So the question comes once again. Our flesh is opposed to the things of the Spirit. Things of the Spirit... His desires aren't just like speaking in tongues and what goes on here in church. It's how he made you. It was important to me when God provided a motorcycle for me. Might not be important to Tracy. Top of the line for me. She's got something else she's believing for. We're unique. Nobody needs to copy each other. But what is your uniqueness and where are you going with it? And when is that day you're going to say, I'm going to put this down. When we looked for our house in Brighton, I should say we. I was at home watching the kids. My husband was a, like a scout on the motorcycle in the truck. I mean, this one, I don't know how long, babe, a year, two years? Yeah, he'd be out there doing that. Why? Because we knew it was coming. Where is it? But a lot of times what we'll do is we'll be like, well, God said we're supposed to move up into this and this is what's supposed to happen because one day we're going to have this and la, la, la. And we look three times and our realtor is not that friendly, so we're done. Done. He was his own realtor. He just goes out. I ain't going to wait for somebody else to be all excited about my dream. (laughs) Right? It's your dream. He gave it to you. It's your picture. Put it on the canvas. And if something happens where it's like, now his nose is all messed up, he's so forgiving. Just take a break from it. Go to God, come back and say, "Ah, I see where that's wrong. All right. All right. Show me, spirit. Show me how I'm going to do that. And because it's oil, 
it moves. Yeah? Because it's oil, it moves. Praise you, Lord Jesus. There are people who are entrepreneurs that are sitting here and you don't even know it yet. There are people that are called to the missionaries field or missions or to give to missions or to be a part of missions and you've been playing with it and it's so high, you know. You're, when are you going to paint? Your flesh is opposed to the spirit. It doesn't want you to paint. If I would have listened to my flesh, I would have been, oh, Sandy, that's so cool. And I'd laughed and done the, you know, <laughs> I don't think I could paint, you know. That's okay. You show me. You just do it. That's what we do a lot of times. Oh, isn't that wonderful? She did that. And then I'll we'll never paint again. No, I shall paint again. Now I have goals. Now I'm like, well, if I can get a lion to sort of look like a lion, I would love to paint pictures of my kids when they're babies that I can pass on to them when I'm going home to Jesus. I mean, all of a sudden it's like, well, now I can start having an effect. It isn't about me and whether or not I can show off a painting. It's like, how could I affect somebody else with that? What is it in you? And you haven't touched the canvas yet. Now, what's scary about that is we can make an excuse and say, but I was scared and I got hurt and I was run over and I was abused and all the same excuses I had. But the brush is in your hand. And those excuses aren't going to cut it. Let's not miss the destiny he has for us and the effect that he can have. Huh? Let's stand here this morning. You know, James goes on, then he keeps talking about um, acts of, of obedience. In verse 26, For as the human body apart from the spirit is lifeless, so faith apart from its works of obedience is also dead. That's a cool way to write that out. So even with our human body, without our spirit, it's just a dead housing. You have to have a spirit in it. And it's the same thing with our works of obedience. That activates our faith. If we don't step out in that, it's dead. It's dead. So what is that canvas? Lord God, we just ask right now. And, and here's the other part. That's something we forget to do. we would be like, somebody pray for me. I need to get what she's saying. All we have to do is ask him right now, and I bet you he'll tell you right now. Yep. He'll remind you of something. You'll be like, well, that? That's little. Yep. Huh? Let's ask him right now. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would reveal from your kingdom what you're asking each and every one of us to do. What is that picture? What is that picture? What is that picture that stands out to us, that just revs us up, that has meaning, that, that's so intense, Lord? What is that picture that will bring life through us? It will cause the blessing to move out onto other people. What is that picture, Lord? Reveal that to us. In Jesus' name. One thing I forgot to say that she said she said, every picture has a focal point. So I had this picture out of, you know, this kid's magazine. Now, each one of you could look at this picture, even though it's not done, and say, I think the focal point is this. Oh, it's his mane. That's what sticks out to me. But for me, it was this eye. And she said, you build everything around that focal point. So you have the picture, but what's your focal point? I had to build everything around that because otherwise it's going to be a blah picture. And you've seen some of those where you're just like, I don't know, it's a scene or something. But there should be something that's like, oh, there it is. And it draws you in. And the rest of the picture builds around that focal point. And I got to get his eye right so that when I got this hanging on my wall, if you come over my house, it feels like he's watching you. That's when you know I got it right. That's that focal point. Father, we're asking for that also in the name of Jesus. 
Our flesh is opposed to the things that you desire for us. The things that you already placed into us, that hope of something new, that gift that you placed there, Lord God, you want to light that up with your blessing. You want to empower it to prosper, to have success down the road in all things, in all ways, at all times, that anything you set your hand to do will prosper in those things. Lord, brand new canvas for all of us. And Lord, we're going to go ahead and use that, which you have by the Spirit. I believe the brush is the Spirit moving through us. Just like you said with your word, Lord God, that it's the Spirit that, that wields the sword. Just like the paintbrush. Wield it through us. And let us be brave enough and full of courage that we're in that right spot with you, that the righteous are bold as lions, that we actually dare to paint on that white canvas. Thank you that we will see your grace in such magnitude that we will not fear. That it's okay because you're so forgiving. Amen. You're so forgiving. You're so forgiving. Yeah. Amen. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I'm just waiting here. Make sure that he's done. Yeah, you settled some things. So now do not depart from what you settled. It's settled. It's done. You're going to paint that picture. And it's going to be good. And it's going to be unique to you. I don't care if you work with, you know, 10 other people who do the same thing that you do. They'll never do it like you do. Remember that. You have something to offer that other people don't because it's you. Yeah? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Lord. Let's just give him thanks. Praise you, Lord God. Praise you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It is you that causes this within us. It is you who gives us hope once again that we might act in our faith and use obedience as those works. Oh, put it all together, Lord God. We've been missing part of the equation. Now, born of the Spirit, those next steps will take place. In Jesus' name. name. Hallelujah. My last thought is, have you ever done something the Lord has asked you to do and everyone else thinks you're crazy? Raise your hand. My husband preached to an auditorium in a school for how long? Over a year? Six months. Okay, I thought it was over a year. Oh, my God. (laughs) I prepared for children's church every Sunday, and there was nobody there. Yeah. And it wasn't too long, and there came Dean. There was another family. There came... That's how far we go back. But I think the va- he's an elder in our church now. If we would have missed that and stopped preaching to that empty thing and preparing, like, where are they coming? You said they're coming. You know, I'm telling you, it feels really awkward because the canvas is white as ever, and there's like nobody there. Can't even paint on anything. That's the feeling. And he preached. And I, God is my witness. This man preached like the place was packed. It was good. And every time I'd be like, man, that would have been good if somebody were in here hear this, because it was good. It's his picture. Yeah. I have to add one thing behind that. You're done? Yeah. That year, we preached on covenant. I had never heard covenant, wasn't taught covenant in Bible school, which is like, but that year the Lord was showing me covenant. And for six months, nobody showed up. And then we started having a few families. I think by the end of the year, we might have had maybe 10 people showing up. It was still pretty sparse. And I preached 56 messages on covenant. To most of them, I preached to nobody. But they saved Jesse's life. Because when Jess got spinal meningitis, when he was about a year, It was what the Lord had taught me preaching to empty seats that got him healed. So even if what you're putting out there seems like this isn't helping anybody, are you getting anything out of it? Because you might have to grow in something first, and then all of a sudden the opportunity to help somebody shows up. So don't quit just because, well, nobody's getting excited. Well, whatever. Did God tell you to do it or didn't he? 
Amen? Be blessed. Have an awesome week.